Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Today is the fourth Sunday of the Blessed Month of Hatur. That means next week we will begin the praises of Kyak, the month of Kyak. And we saw in this month of Hatur, um, in the first two weeks, the same the same passage, the, the sower and the seed. Last week we kind of see this idea of taking up your cross, sacrifice, and today we kind of follow that same type of uh, theme. It's, what are we doing to respond to the message of God? It's, Go sell what you have and give all, and follow me. And there's a response that's needed from each one of us. And at first glance, when we analyze this uh, gospel reading, we see a man with good intentions. He recognizes the Lord Christ as wise and discerning, and he decides to ask him. He asks him a question. He says in verse 17, Now, as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Teacher, what good deeds must I do to have eternal life? It's a good question. It's a great question. And at some point in our lives, I think every man and woman and child, this question will be asked of them. When the Lord Christ responds to him, it is important to note that he doesn't say, well, believe on my name and you will be saved instantly. He tells him that the way to salvation is through obedience to the commandments. Which commandments? In verse 19, the Lord answered him saying, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. The man answered him, saying, in verse 20, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. And there's an important lesson here. You see, what this man was asking all along was not if he could be saved or how he could be saved. He was asking something completely different. He was asking if there was an easy way to be saved. He was trying to see whether or not he was already good enough to get to heaven. The way that the man responds to Christ shows us that he wasn't really interested in eternal life. He was interested in the easy way to get to eternal life. The lesson from the Lord is that receiving eternal life is not easy. Getting to heaven actually involves sacrifice. And anyone who preaches differently than that, is, it involves living outside of my comfort zone. It involves struggle. It involves toil. And do those, do those things get us to heaven? The struggle? No. Those things help us follow Christ and He gets us to heaven. Sometimes, we are sad as Christians because we haven't made much progress. I know, I know me, I'm talking about myself, but, but progress in any discipline in life requires hard work. Look at an Olympic athlete. None of them can just wake up one day and say, you know what, next month I'm going to the Olympics and I'm gonna win a gold medal. No, it doesn't happen. It involves proper training for many hours, days and weeks and years, proper nutrition, a, a thinking and a strategy. It involves coaching. It's, it's the kind of work that is necessary to win a medal. All this is involved. How much more difficult is it to struggle to receive the prize that is eternal and from God? We know that this man was looking for an easy way to heaven, but there are no shortcuts, unfortunately. And the second point was that he was trying to justify himself in front of God. He was trying to prove that he was good enough. The problem is, is that you can never justify yourself to God because he alone declares us righteous and justifies us. Sometimes I meet people who say, well, you know, Father, I don't go to church, but I'm a good person. I get this a lot, especially at Home Depot and things like that. <laughs> people, it's like a magnet. So people say, you know, Father, 
they make it a point to kind of tell it to me. I don't really go to church, but I'm a good person. According to whose standard are we considered good? When people speak this way, it's a sign we have a misunderstanding of what sin is. Or it's a misunderstanding or a mis misrepresentation of how far we've fallen from the life that God really wants us to have. We can't be saved on our own. We can't be saved on our own opinions about ourselves. We can't be saved apart from the grace and mercy of God. That's why our whole liturgical life is spent saying and repeating the words, Lord, have mercy. No matter what we do or how good I feel about myself, I say, Lord, have mercy. An encounter with Christ is always hard because it reminds us or reminds me that God always expects so much from us. And yet I know I have still so far to go. But there is good news. God knows our hearts. He knows our struggles. He loves us and he has mercy on us. In verse 21, this is why it's important that our Lord it said, and Jesus looking at him, loved him. Loved him and said to him, one thing you lack. There's a reprimand there because he loved him. There's a reprimand because he loves him. Go your way, sell whatever you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, follow me. The Lord is not out to hunt us, to imprison us, to punish us. He does want us to check our own hearts. And we need to examine them closely, whether we're looking for an easy way to heaven, or we just think very highly of ourselves. The Lord tells us, that narrow is the way, and there are few that find it. Are we on the narrow path or on the wide path? The path that looks easy, the path that, or the path that's covered in obstacles. Each person has to answer for themselves. Here's a few examples though. Those on the wide path go out of their way to avoid helping others. Whereas those on the narrow path go out of the way to help others. Those on the wide path come to church when it's convenient. Those on the narrow path find it convenient to be at church every day, every week if, if they possibly can. Those on the wide path criticize and nitpick at everything everyone else is doing wrong. Those on the narrow path blame only themselves before God. And the man in the gospel today, he wanted the easy wide path. He left Jesus behind. In verse 22, it said, he was sad at, his word, at this word, and he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. He made his choice. He chose which path he wanted to go on. And I pray that we all have the, the, the courageous nature within us to choose the narrow and difficult way. Speaking of leaving Jesus behind, imagine that you are presented with an opportunity to become one of the disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ during his earthly ministry. Can you imagine? How much would we give for an opportunity like that? How much would we have given to have unfiltered access to Christ himself and watch his ways and watch his miracles and hear the teaching out of his own mouth? There is not a treasure on earth that could possibly outweigh such an honor. This was the invitation given by our Lord Jesus Christ to this man. Yet, this man chose the things that he was attached to. For this man, it was the thought of losing his things, his material wealth, that kept him from growing closer to Christ, from knowing Christ intimately, from serving him, from being honored as one of his disciples. Maybe this man's icon would have been in our churches today. In verse 23, 
And then our Lord looks around and says to the people, his disciples, how hard is it for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God? When the young man went away, the Lord responded, only with difficulty will a rich man enter the kingdom of heaven. Only with difficulty. We, this gospel forces us to ask hard questions to ourselves. What keeps us from growing closer to Christ? What is it? What keeps us from knowing him more intimately? Each one of us is invited to ask such difficult questions as we pray. Only we have to accept that the Lord will answer our difficult questions with difficult answers. Out of his great love for us. Is his desire to heal us even if we don't want to heal ourselves. He wants to see us to have a restored full life. It's not easy. But he knows our hearts. He knows our honesty. If we're being honest with ourselves. And he who conquers death and destroys evil can make it a reality in our lives because he is compassionate, because he is abundant in mercy. St. John Chrysostom writes, specifically in regards to verse 27, when it, when it says, with men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. St. John Chrysostom writes, after Jesus had made eye contact with them, he said, with men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. So, with a pleasant, gentle look, he soothed those whose hearts were terrorized and relieved their anguish. Then he lifted them up with his words as he focused on the power of God and then gave them faith. If we want to know, if we want to learn how the impossible becomes possible, then we have to listen. He didn't make this statement that what is impossible for man is possible for God so that we can merely sit back and relax and leave it all to God. Sometimes it's a misunderstanding of this, of this idea. No, he said this so that you can understand the importance of calling on God's name to give you help in this rigorous contest. So, this brings me to the dangers of being complacent. Complacency has no place in the Christian vocabulary. Comfort and complacency play a large role in what we see is happening in the gospel today. The man wants to justify himself. He's a perfect man who keeps the commandments and he's going to go to heaven. Checked off all the boxes. <clears throat> but our Lord Christ, <clears throat> he turns this man's world upside down by giving him one more command. Go sell what you have. And we hear the statement, we might feel bad for the man. How could the Lord ask so much to this man who just wants to go to heaven? It seems like he's picking on him. But that's not the case at all. He asked much of him because he loved him much. And much was required in order to save him. He was more serious about his riches than he was about heaven. And the truth came out. He was more in love with his comfortable life than he was with following life himself. He did not in fact love God with his whole heart, his whole mind, his soul, his soul and his strength. So we should feel bad for him. We should feel bad for him because he is attached to his material possessions. And he willingly declined an offer, an invitation to be a follower and disciple of Christ. He missed out on a relationship with the Son of God that would have led him to his stated goal. It would have led him to eternal life. So as we summarize and conclude, there is good news to the story. 
God loves us so much. If we approach God and want to grow closer to Him, we know that He is going to help us and attempt to perfect us, just as He tried with this rich man. And when you approach God in prayer and you ask God to make you a, burden, a better person, to make you more patient, to make you more loving, to make you more holy, you have to understand with faith that God wants these things for you more than you want them for yourself. And He alone knows our potential. So, when we ask God to help us, we need to expect that God will answer. He will give us what is necessary for our growth, not what is comfortable, not what's convenient. So when we ask God to help us, He will honor your request. So that's why some people say, be careful what you ask for in prayer. He will honor your request. He will ex allow you to experience challenges. He will allow you to experience tribulation. He will allow you to experience great difficulties. On top of that, He will ask you to make tremendous personal sacrifice. This is the way that God gives us the blessing to follow His Son and putting on Christ daily. Christ alone is our eternal life. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Amen.